Good evening, I'm Zinclair Samoa. Here are a few of the stories we're talking about now tonight. Brittany Griner is back on American soil, ending a 10-month saga. It was a drama mired in Cold War era politics. We'll take you inside the prison swap that brought her home and examine what's next for the basketball star. BG, we, we love you. We thank you uh, for your sacrifice. Then Senator Kirsten Sinema decides she does not want to be a Democrat anymore. So what does this mean for the Democrats' newly cemented majority? I think it's important for me to stand proud as an independent. Plus, in an NBC News exclusive, we'll tell you why the Biden administration wants $3 billion from Congress. Then only eight countries have won the Men's World Cup. Tonight, we'll highlight a nation that, despite the odds, is determined to be the ninth. And we'll sit down with the former executive pastry chef for both the Bush and Obama White House. Why? Well, because it's National Pastry Day. That's why we hope you're hungry. We begin tonight with Brittany Griner's return to the U.S. This morning around 6 a.m., Griner landed at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland in Texas, where she was later taken to Brook Army Medical Center. She is presumed to still be there at this moment as part of an extensive medical evaluation. Meanwhile, in what appeared to be his first public comments about the prisoner swap, Russian President Vladimir Putin is suggesting that more exchanges are possible. The State Department spokesperson Ned Price told our Hallie Jackson that the U.S. is also optimistic. Would you agree with that assessment that there are active discussions around getting Paul Whelan out? Is that how you characterize it? It's not often that you'll hear me say this, but uh, we do agree uh, with Vladimir Putin in the sense that there will uh, be discussions going forward regarding how we are going to get Paul Whelan reunited with his family back here in the United States. The plane will be coming for Paul Whelan. Uh, we're going to bring him home just as soon as we can. Joining us now to dig into this is NBC News correspondent Marissa Pera. Marissa? And before the sun even rose, Brittany Griner landed on U.S. soil here in San Antonio for the first time in that nearly 10-month ordeal, one that eventually sent her to that very severe Russian penal colony that we've been reporting on for months. And this was really, this was a months-long endeavor by the U.S. to get her back to the United States, something that really came together in the last few weeks when the Kremlin said to the United States that it was one or none, and by one they meant Griner. So she stepped foot, you can see an extra step, uh, pep in her step, rather, as she was making her way across the tarmac into the hangar, and then eventually on her way here to the Brook Army Medical Center. And this really is the premier place for people who are in these sorts of situations. We saw this earlier this year with Trevor Reed. He did have health issues that needed tending to, and by all accounts, Brittany Griner, we're not hearing of any health issues, at least physically. Um, we heard from various folks with the State Department that were saying that she seemed like she was healthy. You could see even as she was walking off of the plane she seemed like she was walking just fine and that she seems like she was in good spirits. But one of the major things that they're looking for here is not just that routine evaluation, that medical evaluation. They're also going to do a comprehensive psychological evaluation. So regardless of what the future holds, they're going to want to make sure that she's given all of the best resources psychologically as well going forward. But her wife, Sherelle did say that in terms of what the future holds, they are committed to using their platform, using their voice to make sure to bring home other detained Americans from overseas home like Paul Whelan. Thanks, Marissa, for that report. And here in the U.S., Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema makes a declaration of independence. That's shocking, but perhaps not so surprising. Today, Sinema announced she's leaving the Democratic Party to become an independent. I think it's important for me to stand proud as an independent and say that I will not be a part of what I consider to be an escalating tit for tat. She told Politico that she will not caucus with Republicans and suggested that she intends to vote the same way she has for four years in the Senate. The announcement comes just three days after Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock won his runoff election, solidifying the Democrats' 51-seat majority in the Senate. NBC News senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor has more. 
A major shakeup in Washington today. Senator Kirsten Sinema, the first term Arizona Democrat, has announced that she has left the Democratic Party and is now an independent candidate, a registered independent in Arizona. Now, this comes as Democrats have clinched a 51 to 49 seat Senate majority for the next two years, and that is unlikely to change for practical purposes because Sinema will maintain her committee assignments in the Senate, uh, according to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who said he's agreed to uh, grant grant her those committee seats for the next two years. Uh, it remains to be seen whether Sinema will continue to vote as she has been, which is mostly in alignment with Democrats on nominations, including judges and executive branch nominees, although she has wielded major influence to curtail or shape uh, pieces of legislation, including scaling back President Biden's agenda. Now, this has a big, big implication for Arizona's 2024 Senate run. Let's have a listen to what Senator Kirsten Sinema had to say about why she made this decision. My stand today is about joining the many Americans and lots of Arizonans, in fact, the majority of registered voters, who don't believe that any political party fits them perfectly. Now, one thing Senator Sinema has not said is whether she's actually going to run for re-election in Arizona in 2024 as an independent. It would be a very complicated path in the state of Arizona. And uh, Democrats in the state party insist that they will still put up a candidate in 2024. That could be a challenging three-way race for the Democratic Party if it's uh, a Democratic candidate, Kirsten Sinema is an independent, and a, a Republican candidate. The state Democratic Party has said they've uh, not heard from Sinema at all, that she has fully cut ties with them and that her decision came as a surprise to them. Meanwhile, there are other Democrats, uh, most notably Congressman Ruben Gallego, who represents the Phoenix area, that have been considering a run for Senate. He put out a statement earlier today criticizing Senator Sinema, saying she's only in it for herself, saying her real constituency is Wall Street banks and the pharmaceutical industry. Her intentions in 2024 remain to be seen and could shape what is uh, looking like a very challenging cycle for Senate Democrats uh, in uh, the 2024 election. Zing Clay? A lot to dig into. Thank you, Sahil. And to talk more about this, we're joined now by NBC senior national political reporter, John Allen. Thank you for being here. Good to see you in person. Happy to be on set. <laughs> so it's been a big day. And I think the big question is, how does this affect Democrats and how are they reacting? Such a great question, because that's really what you have to cut to here is what is it? What matters? Mm -hmm. It's not going to matter in the Senate. It's not going to have a practical impact, as Sahil was just saying. She's going to stay on the same committee. She's going to uh, support the Democrats being in the majority there. So this isn't a case where she's flipping parties and changing the balance of power. But what the big decision Democrats in Washington are going to have to make is, do they support her as an independent running for that seat, or do they support a Democrat running for that seat? And then again, in Arizona, there's going to be a question for Democrats who might want that seat, whether they're going to run if the national, uh, the national Senate poobahs of Chuck Schumer and others say uh, that they want to see Sinema reelected. We saw a lot of caution today uh, from Senator Schumer ta talking about how she was a good senator from the White House. Mm. Um, you know, they're not hammering her right now because they know that they might end up being on her side uh, if voters in Arizona are given a choice between a Democrat, a Republican, and an independent cinema, you would have to assume that that would split some of the Democratic right. and independent vote that cinema would need to win. And I'm glad you talked about the White House, right? Because this is or, coming. I'm sorry, or the Democrat if somebody was running as a Democrat. Absolutely. And this is coming on the heels of Warnock's win. We heard from the White House earlier today. First, let's take a listen to what the press secretary had to say. Uh, she has voted with the president 93 percent of the time because she has worked with us on key uh, priorities of this administration. When you think about his economic pol policy, I just laid out all of the different historic pieces of legislation that we have been able to get done, and she has played a key role in that. So you touched on this. It seems that they're treading lightly. Is there more here the White House is concerned about or should be concerned about? I mean, they absolutely have to be concerned about the safety of that seat uh, for Democrats, whether it's a, a Democrat with a D next to their name or Kirsten Sinema, who is supporting uh, the Democratic leadership in the Senate. They have to be concerned about that. I think um, the White House is also in a, in a fragile position or, or a precarious position here because uh, for all of the things that Kirsten Sinema did to slow down Joe Biden's agenda or 
trim it down. In the end, she voted for those things that Joe Biden has been going around the country saying are great for America. So if someone is to look at that and say, well, it's not progressive enough, it didn't do enough, um, that's also a criticism of what Biden ended up signing off on. Um, in the end, she didn't really block a lot of the Democratic agenda. What she did, again, was pare it down a little bit. And we heard from Sahil that there's already some contenders coming out, Representative, or excuse me, Congressman uh, Gallego from Arizona. We heard from him criticizing her today. He said, we need senators who will put Arizonans ahead of big drug companies and Wall Street bankers. What do you make of that? And is he tough competition for her? I mean, during the, uh, during the fights over uh, the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, what became the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we saw Democratic leaders pushing Ruben Gallego to try to get out there and say that he would primary her to put some pressure on her yeah. to go ahead and vote for those things. Well, she did vote for those things in their final format. Uh, she did move them, uh, you know, move the ball for the Biden agenda. But now Ruben Gallego is excited about the prospect of becoming a United States senator. Um, and so uh, I think he's going to take a real look at this. I think there are other Democrats in Arizona. Look, it's a state where the Democratic Party has been told for months and months and months that uh, Kirsten Sinema doesn't represent them uh, by Washington leaders. Uh, and so there are going to be Democrats in Arizona that take a look at this race. On the Republican side, mm -hmm. uh, we're hearing that uh, that Mike Lamb, the uh, the uh, sheriff of Pinal County, is being encouraged to run uh, by some of the the Republican poobahs in that state. Uh, he's somebody who's kind of known, almost a nationally famous sheriff, for his crackdowns on immigration, for his unwillingness to enforce uh, pandemic restrictions and and other um, sort of very conservative positions he's taken and yeah. used his discretion as sheriff to prosecute some things and not others. Mm. Just when you think it's winding down, Georgia runoff is done. We have new news, and you're helping us break it down. John Allen, thank you so much. So nice to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. And we're coming up on one month since the stabbing deaths of four University of Idaho students, a crime that somehow remains unsolved. Their bodies were found on November 13th, and three of the victims lived at the house where the murders took place. The fourth was visiting his girlfriend. Police are now asking the public for help finding the owner of a white Hyundai sedan that was near the crime scene. NBC News' Steve Patterson is in Moscow, Idaho with more. Good evening, Steve. As in Clay, we are now nearly a month into this investigation with no motive, no murder weapon, no suspect. Incredibly frustrating for this community, uh, which is really latent with a, a sense of sadness and fear that people are walking in pairs past 4 p.m. You know, there are college kids, of course, that are going here that are calling their parents every time they go anywhere. And there's not a whole lot of information from the police department. Part of that we know is a tactical decision. It's the way they're playing this, which is close to the vest. Uh, part of the way that they want to play out this detective work. We know they're looking uh, on a few fronts. One, there's a period of time where two of the victims uh, were before they went back to that home uh, those fateful few hours. Uh, two of them we know were at a frat house. There's a period of about a five hour window that detectives are trying to piece together because the frat house to the actual house is only about a two minute walk. Detectives want to know what happened in that five hours. Second is this white Hyundai Elantra. It is the maybe the most solid lead that the public at least is aware of. We know that police are looking for it. It's a model from 2011 to 2013. Uh, police say it was in the area at the time of the crimes, that the occupants have critical information that may be pertinent to the investigation. We know that the public is ready and willing to help because they've been flooding the uh, police department with calls, so much so that there's an overflow that now goes to an FBI tip line. That's how hot and heavy the calls have been. People here want to help. They want to get this solved. And so do police looking for a break in this case. Back to you. Hopefully that break comes soon. Thank you, Steve. And $3 billion. That's how much the Biden administration is asking for to deal with a possible surge of migrants at the southern border. So will Congress approve it? Plus, later this hour, a former White House executive pastry chef joins us live. We'll get the scoop on the menus at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's all coming up on Now Tonight. Welcome back. I'm Zinclair Samoa. The Biden administration is asking for more money as the southern border braces for another surge of migrants. The Department of Homeland Security wants more than $3 billion from Congress, but it comes as House Republicans are set to take control, and they may not be willing to approve the budget increase. Joining us now to talk about this is Julia Ainsley, NBC News Homeland Security correspondent. Julia, it's good to see you. So let's just dig in. Republicans campaigned big on border security for the midterms. That is no secret, and presumably this three 
$3 billion would actually aid border security. So why might they be unwilling to approve the funding? And what are you hearing from them today? Yeah, Sinclair, it does seem a little counterintuitive, right? If you're all about trying to enforce border security, why wouldn't you put more money, more manpower toward that effort? But what Republicans are saying is that they won't give a dime more to Biden's border efforts until there's more done to secure the borders. Uh, basically, what this comes down to for the Biden administration is that they need more people to do the processing, which means interviewing asylum seekers, holding them temporarily as they're processed and sheltered, and then being able to release them with a court date if they do qualify to make that asylum claim. And while they're waiting for that court date, oftentimes they have ankle monitors or they're checking in via cell phone system. There are ways of keeping track of them while they wait to see a judge. But all of that takes time and money. And as you look at more people, the Department of Homeland Security is now estimating as many as 10,000 migrants crossing a day mm -hmm. when these COVID restrictions lift on December 21st. When those numbers go up, they need more people to make sure that there aren't backlogs. We've seen this happen before in 2019. And in fact, early in the Biden administration, there were backlogs at the southern border because they weren't able to get enough people through the system in a fast uh, process. It was for everyone in 2019 under Trump. It was mainly for children in early 2021 when Biden took office. This has happened before, and the conditions get pretty dire. We've heard of reports where people can't get showers, hot meals, a change of clothes. Sometimes where they're so crowded, they can't even lie down and sleep. That mm -hmm. happened under the Trump administration. And so if that happens, sometimes Border Patrol will release people without court dates, without a place to go, without transportation. And that's when the chaos really ensues. And so we may see Republican governor sees on that chaos, saying this is the fault of the Biden administration. But really, what we should be looking at is funding. And if Republicans aren't willing to put forward the funding, then it could lead to more chaos and maybe more buses from Republican governors as they would send more migrants to cities like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. Some things we've already seen, but yeah. perhaps a ramping up of, of tactics like that. And you brought up a good point, right? It's not just about the policy, it's about the people and the impact is really palpable. And it's hard to talk about this without talking about Title 42. It's a Trump era policy that essentially allowed border authorities to use public health restrictions from COVID-19 to expel migrants. So can you help us understand the current controversy surrounding this? Because I heard you mention Trump era policies a lot as you just uh, broke down the first question. Yeah, that's right. So this did start under Trump, but look, it's actually existed even longer under Biden at this point. So in March of 2020, the CDC enacted what they called Title 42, and that was to, by and large, deny asylum seekers the right to come into the United States and claim asylum. They said it was because they would have to be held in congregate care facilities. At the time, some people said, mm, maybe this is a way Biden is trying, or Trump is trying to keep immigrants from coming into the U.S., but it was really pretty quickly accepted because because there were such drastic measures to cut down on travel into the country and to cut down on people being held in large settings together. But then it continued, and it continues to this day, even though so many COVID restrictions have stopped. And it's something the Biden administration said they wanted to end. They finally made moves to end it by May of this year. They were stopped by a court. And then another judge just ruled recently that it should, in fact, lift by December 21st, um, but it could still be enjoined again. Those same Republican states are trying to stop this court process from moving forward. They've now, uh, as of today, gone to the appellate level to try to stop Title 42 from lifting, and it will likely go all the way to the Supreme Court. Those states say that the Biden administration should have spoken to them before making the decision to lift Title 42 because they say they will be unduly burdened by the influx of migrants. But this really isn't a debate about whether or not keeping out migrants prevents the spread of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Very few people are trying to make that argument anymore. It's really about whether or not you can use a public health policy in perpetuity as a means of border enforcement. And to be honest, it really wasn't something the Biden administration has been very eager to do away with. Mm -hmm. It's not something that they were jumping to do right away. It's something they actually have tried to stall on in courts as well. But now is the time where they've decided that they're, they are okay lifting it. They haven't appealed this current order. Um, and so now it's really yeah. up to uh, judges to decide if they'll side with the Republican states on this and keep it in place or not. Definitely a legal battle that will continue to ensue. And I know you'll keep us posted. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much.
And after the break, some other major headlines we're keeping an eye on, including another prison sentence for one of the former officers involved in George Floyd's murder. Plus, the founder of collapsed crypto exchange, FTX, is getting ready to answer questions on Capitol Hill. And have you ever thought about getting LASIK eye surgery? I have, but watch out. The FDA has some warnings. Dr. Sayal joins us to answer your questions. It's time now for some of the headlines we're watching tonight. E-cigarette maker Juul agrees to pay $1.7 billion in a broad legal settlement. The payout covers over 5,000 lawsuits, many of them accusing the company of marketing its addictive products to kids and teens. Juul maintains that it never targeted young people and is working to regain the public's trust. Charges against former Michigan Governor Rick Snyder in the Flint water crisis are now dismissed. Snyder, who left office in 2019, was facing two misdemeanor counts of willful neglect of duty. He is now the eighth person to have charges relating to the crisis thrown out. According to the White House, Russia is now providing an unprecedented level of military and technical support to Iran. This appears to be an exchange for the drones Tehran has been supplying Russia for the war in Ukraine. Biden officials warn this full-fledged defensive partnership poses a threat to Iran's neighbors as well as Ukraine. Sam Bankman-Fried confirming on Twitter today he will testify before a House committee next week. The FTX founder was quiet, however, about a similar request from a Senate committee. Both committees are looking for answers on the sudden collapse of FTX, the cryptocurrency exchange created by Bankman-Fried. And comedian Jared Carmichael will host the Golden Globes for its 80th year. After a one-year hiatus, the award show will return for a live broadcast on NBC and Peacock come January. Nominations will be revealed Monday on the Today Show, so tune in. In May 2020, a black man, George Floyd, was murdered. The fallout from that incident continues to unfold, and now one of the former officers involved in his murder has been sentenced to prison again. J. Alexander King received three and a half years for aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. He knelt on George Floyd's back during the deadly arrest. He's already serving three years in prison for a federal charge of violating Floyd's civil rights. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster has this report. Alexander King, one of the four former Minneapolis Police Department officers on the scene as George Floyd was killed, was sentenced today to three and a half years in prison uh, after pleading guilty to aiding and embedding the manslaughter of George Floyd. Now, while this sentence does conclude his state proceedings, it does not add any additional prison time for King, who's already in federal prison serving a sentence for a deprivation of George Floyd's rights. He was convicted earlier this year in that case. King did not say anything in this virtual hearing, uh, but we did hear from both the prosecutors and his defense attorneys as this hearing was underway. We heard from the prosecutor, Matthew Frank, saying that Mr. King's conduct was not only unprofessional, it was a crime because in ignoring his education, his training, and his experience, his oath, and his very humanity, Mr. King directly contributed to the death of George Floyd. We also heard from King's attorneys who said, yes, King accepts responsibility and the consequences for his actions, but said that this was about a lack of training in the Minneapolis Police Department. King's attorney going on to say, it is clear that leadership learned nothing and forgot nothing. They failed Mr. King, they failed Mr. Floyd, and they failed the community. Now, while the, this does bring us closer to the end of the criminal proceedings surrounding George Floyd's murder, we still are waiting for a decision on one of the other officers on the scene that day. This is Tu Tao, the officer who was interacting with the crowd the most that day. He said that he was not going to plead guilty, but instead of uh, having a lengthy and uh, really emotional trial, he is allowing the judge to consider written evidence, written testimony, and written closing arguments, and the judge will make a decision. We're expecting that decision to come sometime in the next two and a half months. Back to you. Thanks, Shaq, for that report. And now to a story three years in the making, the trial on the murder of a black woman, Tatiana Jefferson. This week, prosecutors in Texas resting their case. The 28-year-old died after a former police officer, Aaron Dean, shot and killed her in her family's Fort Worth, Texas home back in 2019. Here's a look at why it took so long for the trial to begin. How, how did she pull the gun out of her purse? She looked at her purse, and then she, when she looked at it, she got it and just had it next to her. 
The incident started as a non-emergency call to police. The front door of Jefferson's home was open, according to police. Body camera video showing the officer, Aaron Dean, approaching the front door of the home on October 12, 2019, then walking around the side of the home. In the body cam video, Dean shouts at Jefferson to show her hands, moments before fatally shooting the 28-year-old through the rear window of the home with a single bullet. Put your hands up, show me your hands. Dean is not heard identifying himself as police. Police say Jefferson was playing video games with her then eight-year-old nephew, who, according to police record, said his aunt pulled out a gun after hearing noises behind the house. It is unclear, based on police records, if Dean knew Jefferson was armed. The shooting sparked widespread outrage and a speedy response from the Fort Worth, Texas Police Department. They promptly released the body cam video. Dean quit and was charged with murder and non-negligent manslaughter just two days after the shooting. He pled not guilty and went free on $200,000 bond. How usual or unusual is it for a police department to respond to a fatal police shooting like this? Most of the time, police departments will take their time investigating before they take disciplinary action. But that pace slowed. In contrast, George Floyd the black man killed by a white officer in 2020 was killed seven months after Jefferson. And that former officer, Derek Chauvin, went on trial and was convicted over a year and a half ago. Dean's trial is just starting. It took three years for this trial to begin. What do you think factored into the delays? We shouldn't be that surprised that the trial took this long to happen because we're still in the tail end of COVID. And while the pandemic may be over, the courthouse backups are not over. Reportedly, trial delays were due to the pandemic, appeals, and recurring illness from Dean's team, according to the Associated Press. Dean's attorney died the same week as jury selection. Dean's team did not immediately respond for comment. The family of a Tatiana Jefferson says, in part, they are relieved that it's going forward, but they are extremely anxious during this process. In a case like this, ultimately, it's going to be what a reasonable officer would have done in the same position and what information was known to that officer in that moment. We'll be following that case closely. Now we turn to your health and a specific procedure many have looked at. I am talking about LASIK eye surgery. It's been a pretty commonplace procedure since the FDA approved it in the late 90s. Every year, more than half a million adults undergo the surgery to correct poor vision. But now the FDA is weighing whether to warn patients about potential risks like double vision, dry eyes, or difficulty driving at night. So let's bring in NBC News medical fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal, to talk about this. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I am very invested in this because I have considered LASIK. So first of all, what goes into this procedure? How does it actually work? Yeah, well, good evening. I mean, I've considered LASIK as well. I, I'm, you know, of the nature of I can't see far away or nearsighted. Mm -hmm. um, but LASIK is actually, you know, lace, laser eye surgery is really what it is. And so they take a laser and they target the cornea of your eye, which is, a, is the clear outermost layer of your eye. And basically by reshaping that part of the eye, they, they allow it so light hits the back of the eye, called the retina, mm -hmm. better so you're able to see more clearly. Um, now, to be clear, this is for people who are nearsighted, farsighted, or who have astigmatism, but not for really indicated for people of age-related vision loss, meaning as you get older past the age of 40 and you need reading glasses, that's not really where LASIK comes into play. And it's kind of hard to hear this news because this procedure has been around for a long time, the 90s. So how is this kind of development just coming out now? Well, it's a good question. You know, it's this development didn't really come out of left field. So going back to 2009, the FDA started to kind of pick up that patients were complaining that they weren't totally warned about the side effects of LASIK. I think the general public generally thinks that this is well tolerated. There's really minimal side effects, which is true. But people aren't really aware that you could be left with dry eyes, with floaters, with permanent vision changes. So the FDA now released this draft document with data after five years showing, you know, 17 percent are now relying on eye drops for dry eyes. Two percent are having visual disturbances like floaters or halos and 8% are actually having difficulty driving at night um, because of those things that we just mentioned. I mean, those are pretty serious considerations. So how are doctors and maybe former patients reacting now? And I also wonder what you might say to someone considering LASIK today. 
Yeah, so, you know, the FDA posted this draft document in June or July. They allowed for public comment, which means that, you know, the general public is allowed to submit their concerns and their comments about the document. And we took a look at some of those. Um, a lot of them, you know, patients were claiming to have undergone LASIK and having permanent side effects, really rejoicing in the fact that the FDA is acknowledging this so other people don't have to suffer like they have. Mm -hmm. Now, we reached out to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, um, basically the medical group responsible for those who, who, who perform the procedure, you know, saying in a statement to, to NBC News here, um, that the, the risks, the, the, the document doesn't really focus on, on, the, on the risks, it doesn't really focus, excuse me, on the benefits of the procedure, really focusing too much on the risks. Um, so they are a little bit concerned that this document is one-sided and, and doesn't really sell it, uh, people enough on the benefits of the procedure. Yeah, as with everything, balance, and you always have to consider risks when you do a medical procedure. Exactly. Important analysis, Dr. Akshay yeah. Sile, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take a look back. One year ago in Mayfield, Kentucky, lives were lost, homes destroyed, and businesses ruined. Tomorrow marks the one-year anniversary since a deadly tornado destroyed much of this small town. We're now checking in on the rebuild. MSNBC anchor Jose diaz Ballard is in Mayfield with more. Today there is hope in Mayfield, Kentucky, as it continues to recover and rebuild from last year's tornado that carved a path of death and destruction for nearly 200 miles. At least 88 people died across five states. I get my picture. Invite it. Invite it. A temporary memorial now stands in downtown for the 24 people who died in Mayfield and Graves County. A year ago, County Commissioner Tyler Goodman, who represents Mayfield, joined our live coverage. He joined us again in exactly the same place. You can rebuild the buildings, you can rebuild the, the restaurants, the retail spaces, but you can't replace people. A year ago, we were on the ground in Mayfield. Hundreds of buildings, homes, places of worship destroyed in a matter of seconds. Driving here on Broadway a year ago, one found just a scene of destruction and devastation. One year later, there is still so much rebuilding to do. But many homes have already been rebuilt, including a brand new house for Beatriz and Luis Valero and their granddaughter, nine-year-old Alaya. We first met them last year after they survived by hiding inside their bathroom. I was thinking that we weren't going to make it. God had his arms around us. Does that tornado still hurt you? Yes. When it rains or thunder, I get so nervous, so scared, and I, like, I start crying. Everything inside their house was sucked up by the tornado. Everything but their statue of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. It did not move. That's a miracle. She was there with us, taking care of us. The Mennonite Disaster Services Homes and Hope built and furnished their home for free. I couldn't believe it. I started crying. There's still a lot of good people out there. Homes and Hope also built Jimmy Galbraith's new home. I love it, man. I ain't never had nothing. This is what God will do for you, man. I never seen a town jump in there and uh, get it together like they did. Amid a long recovery, more reasons for hope. A restaurant reopens in the middle of mostly empty lots. The barn is back. We're back. The barn is the first and only restaurant that has reopened in downtown Mayfield. The landmark restaurant has been in Suzanne Flint's family since 1954. The tornado turned it to rubble. I knew immediately we were, we were going to rebuild. Really? You know, that was not a question. With the help of the community, the restaurant reopened just six months later. Our customers appreciate it. They have a place to go, whereas so many, you know, for so long and lost anywhere to go. The sounds of a busy restaurant. A sign that Mayfield is coming back. Because Mayfield is strong, a city as resilient as its people. Thank you, Jose, for that report. Now, World Cup fans, listen up. Did you turn off the World Cup matches today thinking they were over? Well, that may have been a mistake. Both games captivating fans in extra time and penalty kicks. And tomorrow, Morocco fans hope the team will make history again as they play their very first quarterfinal match. Your World Cup roundup is next.
absolute joy. That was the reaction of Croatian fans after the first of two penalty shootouts at the World Cup today. Croatia shocked Brazil in the first quarterfinal. That sets up a semifinal against Argentina, who squandered a 2-0 lead before coming back to beat the Netherlands, also on penalties. The other side of the bracket kicks off tomorrow. England plays France in one match, while Portugal plays Morocco in the other. TLDR, Morocco is the biggest underdog left, and who does not love an underdog story? But it's not just about the sport. The team is also carrying the hopes of an entire region. NBC's Gotti Schwartz has more. It was the World Cup stunner that sent Morocco into a frenzy. A penalty shootout victory for the North African nation, shocking the world with a dramatic win over previous World Cup winners, Spain. The match winner scored by Akraf Hakimi, who actually grew up in Madrid, where his mother used to clean houses in the Spanish capital. His goal sparked celebrations not only on the streets of Morocco, but across Africa, the Middle East, and Arabic neighborhoods around the world. Tunisian, Egyptians, all the people who support Morocco today we are so happy, so proud. What a Morocco. freaking beauty! That penalty, that final penalty from Ashraf Hakimi. Uh, today I am very happy, and Arabic people are uh, very happy also because the Morocco today win. Up next for Morocco is a quarterfinal matchup against Portugal, who are the favorites to advance. Morocco is only the fourth African country to make it this far, and the first Arab one. None has ever made it to the semifinals. Tomorrow, that could all change. There is a big pressure, you know, uh, because everybody is supporting us, especially the, the Arab world and African teams, you know, African countries too. And this is, should be should be advantage for, for, for our national team. Morocco ends up representing an entire culture, an entire continent, not only in Africa, in the, mid, in the Arab world as well. We as African, we are trying to accomplish is far beyond just football. We are trying to tell the world that uh, Africans have time. We are very talented. We can go for better things than we can achieve. Thanks, Gadi. And Masara Makati joins us now to talk about this. She's a communities uh, and engagement reporter with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. So you were watching this game. Tell us about how the community is responding to this match. Man, I've got to say, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm so excited to talk about this topic. Um, the excitement around this match, and not just this match, but really every game that Arab teams have been playing at this World Cup has been insanity in the Arab community across the world. Um, the word that I would use to describe the sentiment across the Arab world and diaspora is elation. The Arab teams have performed better at this year's World Cup than ever before, and those performances have galvanized a wave of pan-Arab solidarity and pride. And like people were saying in this preview clip, it doesn't matter whether you're Moroccan or Egyptian or Palestinian. Every Arab is rooting for every Arab team. And I thought it was really interesting that you write that even countries who did not qualify for the World Cup were surging with pride, especially Palestine. Can you talk to us about the pro-Palestine sentiment you're seeing at this World Cup? You know, um, the Palestinian cause is one that is near and dear to the hearts of many Arabs across the world, and that has certainly been evident at this World Cup. This is the first time the World Cup has been hosted in an Arab country, and it's probably the first time there has been such a large gathering and concentration of Arabs across nationalities in one place. And without fail, at almost every single game, including the watch party that we went to in Philadelphia, including in the preview clips that you just showed, there have been fans holding the Palestinian flag or banners that say Free Palestine up high in the stadium. There was a fan that ran across the field during the Tunisia-France game uh, with the Palestinian flag. And of course, after beating Spain, the Moroccan team gathered for their victory photo and they unfurled not the Moroccan flag, 
but the Palestinian one. And that's really gone to show that while Arab governments have begun normalizing relations and ties with Israel, that sentiment is not really paralleled in the streets. And Arabs and non-Arabs are alike are still quite passionate about the Palestinian cause. And, I mean, you're getting into geopolitics here, and it's not lost on me that Morocco, <laughs> Spain, Portugal... The political and geographic nature of these countries, you know, they're close in proximity, but also Spain and Portugal are countries that actually colonize Morocco. How is that playing out? Is that even being discussed? Oh, man, if you ask any Arab, they will most likely tell you that it was impossible to watch these games without that historical and political context lingering in the backs of their minds. Tunisia versus France was a really prime example of that, um, a game of the colonized versus the colonizer. And one of the people that I interviewed for my story, Mustafa Lawin, who is Moroccan, he told me that the victory felt like a form of revenge. And I think that's a sentiment that's echoed particularly among North Africans, as those are countries that have had long, fraught colonial relationships with France, and their diasporas are subject to heavy discrimination by the country and its society today. But like you said, whether it's a country with a painful history like France, or just another heavily favored and star-studded team like Argentina, Saudi beating Argentina, these victories are laced with another layer of satisfaction because for so many people across the Arab world and diaspora, it feels like they're flipping the established global political and social hierarchy on mm. its head. And that's an important point, right? It's not just Arab nations, even North African nations are really responding to this uh, in these games. And I wonder, any predictions for tomorrow and just overall sentiments from these communities <laughs> that we're talking about? I mean, I think everyone has their hopes really, really high. Of course, they really want Morocco to win tomorrow. Um, it's already, Morocco has had such an amazing run so far. And if they win tomorrow, that would just uh, take the excitement and that elation and that pride and solidarity to a whole other level. It's been an incredible experience for people across the Arab world and diaspora. And I know that they don't want it to end tomorrow. Well, time will tell. We'll all be watching to see if it does. Masara Makati, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And now turning to something sweet, a look into the world of pastry making on National Pastry Day. A former White House executive pastry chef joins us live. Stay close. Okay, it's Friday, which is great news in itself. But did you know today is also National Pastry Day? Yes, that is right. And the timing could not be better because, I mean, no holiday season is complete without those after-dinner dessert essentials. Now, within the world of baked goods, there are a select few who have made sweet treats for some of the most famous among us. We're talking about the Pope, late Queen Elizabeth II, and even two former U.S. presidents. NBC's Gary Grumbach sat down with a former White House pastry chef to learn more about the art of Baking. He's baked pies for the Pope and quiches for the Queen of England. But for President George W. Bush... I once overheard a conversation that President Bush uh, was concerned about his weight and he wanted to eat healthier. So for dessert, I made what I called an apple salad. So I was told that President Bush said, apple salad. Apple salad is not a dessert. Apple salad is a salad. <laughs> so I went the next day, I made a peach pie. All was well. But the former White House executive pastry chef wouldn't trade his experience for the world. It was thrilling. It's truly an honor. Like, I only know how to do one thing, and that's bake. So if I could do that in some way in service to my country, I was really proud of that. I still am. Yasis served the Bush and Obama administrations as lead pastry chef for countless state dinners, family meals, and holiday parties. The two presidents that you worked under could not be more different politically, but they had some similarities when it came to pastries. Maybe the only thing they agreed on was they both loved like traditional American desserts, pie, cobbler, ice cream, bread pudding, those kind of like homey things that we all like. We, we, we call Bill the crust master because uh, his pies, I don't know what he does, whether he puts crack in them or... And whether the baking is done at your house or the White House, Bill has some advice for fellow pastry chefs. Once you have a feeling for the ingredients, 
for the texture of when it's mixed, when it's too mixed, when it's not mixed enough. That's the art part. And that's when it really gets fun, I think. But Bill was one of the lucky ones. When the pandemic hit, the leisure and hospitality industry suffered significant losses. In April 2020, more than 7 million Americans lost their jobs in the service industry. 5 million of those jobs were in the food services sector. Johnny Scott, a pastry chef from Arlington, Virginia, was one of the 5 million. She was laid off twice during the pandemic. When restaurants are doing bad, they're often the first to go because for some reason they're not seen as important as the other cooks and chefs and the positions in the restaurant. She says pastry chefs have not had it easy for quite some time now. It's more than what Food Network shows us. It's not all glamorous. You know, there's a lot of very long hours. It's very physically demanding work. I lost a lot of weekends and holidays with my family. While the leisure and hospitality sector have recovered some of their pre-pandemic losses, they're still not back to pre-pandemic levels. But there is hope restaurant goers will continue to save the best for last. Gary Grumbach, NBC News, Washington. Thank you, Gary, for that tasty report. And joining us live now is former White House pastry chef Bill Yasses. Thank you so much for being here. I'm kind of sad you're not here in person because I think I may have gotten a pastry. Is that true? I hope so. Uh, well, I, yeah, I usually travel with something. Uh, I don't like to go empty handed. Well, you can always mail it to us. But let's jump okay. in here. I know that there was a recent feature in the Bon Appetit magazine, pretty popular magazine, and it highlighted the plight of pastry chefs that we just heard a little bit about. It was titled Pastry Chefs Fear They're Becoming Extinct as Restaurant Margins Shrink. And the piece discusses why pastry chefs are often the first to go in a post-pandemic world with high inflation. I wonder, given that you've been so involved with this, what are your thoughts? Can the restaurant industry and subsequently pastry chefs bounce back from the effects of the pandemic? I think so. The important thing is to uh, remain uh, flexible, adaptable. I mean, it is true that small restaurants, mom and pop restaurants, can rarely afford to have somebody who is uh, only involved in pastry. For one thing, the the return on the investment for pastry is a little lower. Your average check uh, or average pastry price on a menu is half what the main course is. Mm. So what I would recommend is that people sort of diversify a little bit and maybe, um, you know, train in savory as well, because it used to be the case that um, you would have the same person do garde manger, which is known as salads or appetizers, and pastry. Since mm. they usually don't hit the station at the same time, you might do the apps in the beginning of the evening and desserts at the end. So that's one way to, um, as a pastry chef, to stay relevant. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of places now are hiring one pastry chef for several outlets, so they may um, either use a central facility or move around and train individuals in each uh, location to yeah. execute the desserts. So, I mean, the the industry is very adaptable. Absolutely. And we'll find a way. But uh, I think desserts are here to stay. You know, if you go to a restaurant and there's no dessert menu, uh, you might not go back. <laughs> I think desserts are definitely here to stay, and it sounds like you're talking about versatility for pastry chefs who are looking to stay in That's business. Right. I wonder, though, what is one of your favorite memories from your time as the White House pastry chef? I mean, I'm sure you've seen so much and you serve so much. Yeah. Um, gosh. Um, well, it's all. It, as I say, I said in the previous uh, segment, uh, it's certainly an honor to be there, and I, I just loved sort of being a fly on the wall of history, seeing all those things. Um, I think the best part for us, because we consider our job at the White House to be uh, offering some moment of respite from the sort of pressure of that job mm. for the first family. So the best times for me was when they could have family and friends over, um, they didn't have to be, you know, in the under the microscope or in the goldfish bowl, whatever you want to call it. And we could make something that was just that we knew they liked yeah. and their friends liked. It wasn't didn't have to be designed for uh, a state dinner. It was just like comfort food. And uh, those were those were to me the most satisfying moments for both. Uh, the Bush family and the Obama family. Mm. Well, I'm sure it was really satisfying for them as well. Thank you so much, Bill, for sharing your insights and experiences with us. Thank you.
Thanks for having me. Of course. And if the pastries weren't sweet enough for you, here are your 60 seconds of joy to take you into the weekend. Bring on the lights. An upstate New York family is looking to break its own world record for the largest residential Christmas light display. The family's house is decked with over 700,000 lights, the setup requiring 40 miles of wire. A six-year-old girl has an unusual request for Los Angeles County, asking them in a letter if she can keep a unicorn in her yard. If she finds one, of course, the county writing back. And they said yes, but with some conditions like providing the pet with sunlight, moonbeams, and, of course, rainbows. And lastly, if you got to have more cowbell, Will Ferrell's got you covered. He made a surprise appearance during his son's concert, reprising his role from the iconic Saturday Night Live sketch, More Cowbell from 2000. That does it for us. Thanks for ending your day right. I'm Zinclay Samoa for NBC News Now. Tonight, the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.